what is that six o'clock in the uk yeah correct <laughs> uh we have a fantastic topic today and i'm really excited to have uh, ellen mercer uh and nick factor with it both with intro hive with us to talk about the uh, business development in times of big data so what does data driven business development look like this is the subject of today's webinar and just to frame the conversation we're going to have this evening um, i would i would say there are probably three waves of business development in law firms maybe it's more but the first wave is that everybody thought it's people's business uh, and business development as a function was something that was subordinate to all other things because people thought it's the the personal relationship from a lawyer to a client that drives business um, and shapes the industry. Uh, then came the time of professionalizing business development with all the documents that we, we now, nowadays know uh, and all the metrics that sit behind in pricing and finding the right teams. And then it comes to the awards people uh, put on there. Uh, their medals and, and all that stuff. And then it went into a direction where we probably uh, in this industry thought that business development is something that has the same sales funnel as consumer goods. And then we started to look at the, uh, the world of uh, selling products, attraction, interest, desire, and action, and we're sort of using tools and working with a, with a, with a mindset that compared legal work uh, more to consumer goods than to other stuff. And probably the pendulum is now swinging back and that is the reason why I'm happy to have uh, Alan and Nick with us today because uh, the question is, to what extent is uh, business development in law firms and creating uh, relationships still a per personal thing that has to do uh, in a people's business with the personal relationship between a lawyer and the client, and to what extent can we boost and promote business development by using uh, technology, by using uh, smart uh, uh, data, and by tapping into all the things we can draw from the sources we have in a way more intelligent, in a way more complex way than this was possible maybe 10 or 20 years ago. So I think we're sort of entering the next phase of business development in professional services firms. And I know that um, Alan and Nick have, have given a lot of thought to this. Uh, both are industry directors with IntroHive. Uh, Nick does this with Inks and the Financial Services. Alan is focused on the legal industry. Uh, they both will give us an insight into what they know and what they have learned over the course of developing IntroHive into what it is today um, in terms of how they how data can be used into driving uh, client relationships. And I'm just handing it over to uh, Nick now to kick it off, uh, headed, headlined, uh, unlocking the power of business relationships. Nick, we are curious to learn from uh, your insights. Great. Well, um, many thanks. Oh, by the way, just uh, just before before we kick it off, yeah, uh, just to note that this webinar will be recorded uh, and it can be found on Elta's YouTube channel uh, from tomorrow morning on. Uh, and please make sure you use the um, the chat function to ask questions. Julia uh, will help us to make sure that we uh, leave no question unanswered. So. Fantastic. Uh, great. Thank you, Harry Ulf. Uh, fantastic uh, introduction and, and good evening, everyone. Um, if you can't hear me clearly, um, let me know. But really delighted to be taking part and really grateful to, to, to be getting involved. Um, uh, as uh, Harry Ulf suggested, there's uh, myself and Alan on the call. Um, as for me, I'm uh, industry lead, as Harry Off said, which means I, I sell for IntraHive. Um, a lot of what I do is banking and FS, but I also do my fair share of um, professional and legal services, which I came to know um, Harry Off as we're currently engaged with the firm that he runs, uh, SMP. Um, and certainly, I think law firms are one of the most important industries for us. We've got somewhere between, and Alan, you can correct me here, but somewhere between 50 and 60 uh, law firm customers from the 
the Hogan Lovells at one extreme to a, to a number of very small sort of boutique 50 man, 50 practitioner firms here in the UK. Um, I think the goal of today is not to give you a, a sales pitch per se, um, but more to get you thinking about, um, you know, relationships and how to use data to provide a greater insight into, into your relationships and, and really how data and digital innovation is, is driving transformation across traditional industries such as law firms and, and, and the impact that's having on the, the industry mindset, as it were. So I'm going to provide a brief 15 minute um, um, presentation outlining some of the, the key trends and then Alan will sort of translate that quite clearly into the world of the, the law firm um, and maybe at the end we can um, provide a little um, peek um, of um, what Intrive is but it's great to have a, a really sort of diverse group of um, professionals joining so just um, 30 seconds on background we're a Canadian technology company established in 2012 um, we launched our international office in London in 2017 and from there we're engaging quite frequently um, across EMEA and our business is growing quite rapidly. So um, if we move onto the deck, so if we take a step back, business is obviously all about relationships. That's not a particularly controversial statement. Relationships have always been critical to growth. They underpin the success of every organization and people buy from people they trust. But in today's environment, there's two key trends that are putting relationships under closer scrutiny. Um, the first of these is client experience. Trends such as globalization and commoditization pressures have reduced the impact of differentiating your product in the market. And the result is that the client experience is, is rapidly becoming a key competitive edge people talking to each other, the world becoming a, a smaller place. And the upshot is that the service that we provide is, is becoming commoditized. Now, when we talk about professional services, legal services, whatever it is, the reality is that more and more people are comparing on price. And in, in some areas, it feels like a race to the bottom. For a lot of companies, it's not a great place to be. So this effective servitization of offerings is forcing companies to be more responsive to their clients' very specific business needs. Rising customer expectations is something that we're all experiencing. And if we can differentiate ourselves with service and truly know our clients and their needs, this is going to put us in a much better position relative to the competition. Coupled with this, new information and communication technologies are disrupting the way people and organizations buy from each other and therefore the way that they form business relationships and, and technology can be seen as something scary but it can also help us with this service piece we're talking about technology that helps us better understand that very human endeavor of delivering a service to a customer the conundrum here is that more focus on the client experience is based on a detailed understanding of that client however the tools that at our disposal for building a relationship with the client are changing and traditional means are less relevant. So when we say business is all about relationships, there appears to be a disconnect between intention and reality. And we don't have to search very hard to find various statistics lamenting the state of business to business client relationships. I think the stat highlighted here is from a recent Gallup report that found that only 29% of business to business clients are actively engaged with their service provider, meaning that the remaining 71% fall into an indifferent or actively disengaged state with the provider with whom they have a relationship with. Most don't feel they're experiencing that targeted service or, or feel invested with the organizations they're working with. And the most worrying one for me is this 81% um, this over on the right. Four out of five customers who said their service provider could definitely have done something different to stop them ending that relationship, which probably ties back to the 47%, almost half, whose concern is that their service provider is not acting as a trusted advisor. So given how critical relationships are to all of our success, and we all talk about how important they are, I think these stats are surprising. So what's going on? I think the challenge here is that despite how obviously important these business relationships are to our success, it's amazing how little companies know about those relationships and simply identifying who knows who, the strength of that relationship, who we're currently actively engaged with can be powerful. But getting this information is hard. The broadcast email, does anyone know anyone at Coca-Cola or organization ABC, 
as a means to gather this intelligence is very inefficient. And businesses and our colleagues tend to have quite a blinkered view of how well we know our clients. The focus is very much me, it's subjective. At best, this view broadens to include our team, what's our team's relationship with a client, but it's still very subjective. At very best, it's our department, perhaps even our building. But what it doesn't do is show us how our, our clients perceive us. Our clients don't care for how we organize ourselves or, or the structure we have locally or, or globally. So trying to answer these questions of who knows who and how well is, is a really difficult challenge and it becomes even more so the more successful we are as we grow across borders, we launch new um, uh, practice areas, set up in new geographies. The challenge here is that the process and systems a lot of our companies have in place don't really support that need to understand relationships and they struggle with the, the multi-dimensional and dynamic nature of those relationships. Let's take the business systems that we all use. If we consider CRM, it's the, the hub of all client information for most companies, it's the master database, it's the center of everything it's supposed to be. CRM tells us about our, our client accounts, um, the contacts within those accounts, the activities associated with those accounts. And if we're lucky, there's insight on how we're interacting within that client account and, and how the relationship is evolving. But this information is gathered manually. It's like walking up the down escalator. There's a ton of effort to require to capture it. And we're constantly fighting a losing battle against poor data quality. Business intelligence reports, they can evaluate and segment clients. However, by different definition, they're lagging indicators based on past performance. And we all know the caveat about past performance. Key account management planning also relies on business intelligence. Also, it can be more about the subjective view of the account team than anything else. And finally, client surveys is typically based on generalizations such as excellent and, and good to gauge relationships and also they're lagging indicators. And again, subjective and opinion based rather than helping you to build an accurate picture of the health of a relationship. So we have to ask to what extent do they actually provide the insight we need to understand our day-to-day -day business relationships. They're all disparate systems. So we get a fragmented view of reality and it's an incomplete picture of our clients and it risks providing false confidence. The reason for this is that while relationships underpin the success of every organization, for the majority, relationships are in reality the result of success rather than the cause of success. Whereas our contention is that a relationship should be the source of competitive advantage driving business success. So do relationships deliver better business outcomes? I think for the 29% of service providers, like yourselves who are actively and successfully engaged with their clients, they experienced higher revenue, higher profitability and a greater share of wallet. 68% of revenue comes from existing relationships, mostly from the top 20% of your client base. Power of referrals, senior business leaders are five times more likely to engage via warm introductions. 84% of decision makers start a buying process with a referral. Referrals from relationships shorten uh, any selling cycle. So yes, they deliver business success. And in the context of new business development, I think they deliver competitive advantage. But how do you leverage relationships to generate these warm introductions and referrals if there's limited visibility of that relationship? So if you consider the employees in your organization, most engage with customers clients and external entities at differing levels. They all have their own networks. They all have their own contacts. Um, and this will largely be invisible to the rest of the organization. We've all built our own professional networks built up over the years. So a cross section of people in your organization are talking to a cross section of people at your, your client organization or, or your target organization. But consider if you could start to understand the touch points between your employees and multiple clients, genuinely understanding that, that who knows who, as well as understanding an aggregated organizational perspective and make that visible and actionable to employees on a daily basis. Relationship capital, we say, is the network of people and organizations that represent employees, clients, partners, and suppliers. And it, it's explained as the value created and maintained by having 
nurturing and managing good relationships. Traditionally, it's been considered an intangible aspect of an organization's intellectual capital and often seen through the lens of uh, image or client loyalty or satisfaction. If you consider if you can uncover these touch points across multiple organizations and build up a view of the ever-changing and multi-dimensional nature of those relationships, and then you multiply this complexity by 10 or by 100, and you interpret it on a daily basis and you'll realize that that's a, a quite a complex problem using big data. How do you get insight on that data in a timely manner? How do you discount the noise within the data? So I think this ability to surface intelligence from this mass of data is a game changer and it's this that allows you to start managing relationships as a strategic asset and shifting the role of relationships to a driver of success rather than the consequence and this ultimately in an environment where organizations are struggling to engage with clients so understanding your relational capital i think is absolutely key to driving all of these things that you see here let me distill and just pull out the most important points for you to take away understanding the relationship touch points to give you that 360 degree view breaking down the silos between departments and even locations, getting colleagues collaborating as you surface relationship insight, understand the dynamic nature of the relationships on an ongoing basis, understand where effort needs to be directed and ultimately drive innovation in your organization. So a bit of a busy slide, but from a client management maturity perspective, we would contend that as organizations mature and start to think more strategically about CRM and optimizing its power, they will really only be able to look at CRM as a strategic tool if they start to understand the multidimensional and dynamic nature of client relationships. So I'm gonna hand over to, bear with me, excuse for the break. Okay, Alan, you should have control. Okay, thank you, Nick. Um, hello, everybody. Um, Alan Mercer here. I'm just going to now try and translate um, some of the um, points that Nick's uncovered so far and translate this into how specifically um, this is affecting the law firms that we are working with and talking to. Just as a way of background, I spent 15 years um, working in law firms myself as a BD and marketing director. Uh, before joining IntraHive, where now I'm talking mainly to BD and marketing directors and the owners of, of law firms. So hopefully um, have a fair enough understanding of the challenges that law firms face around understanding the relationships that they have um, from a political, cultural, structural point of view. Um, so um, I'll move on to um, some of the reasons why law firms are experiencing issues and, and why they are turning to technology like IntraHive. So um, first of all, as Nick has covered, you know, firms are generally looking for better ways to understand and measure and manage their client relationships. And I would suggest that unless you can measure your relationship capital, your relationship strength accurately and objectively, then how can you um, move forward to manage those relationships or set KPIs around them if you have no starting point as to, to what the status quo looks like. Um, most firms we speak with have <coughs> limited relationship visibility. It's not allowing them to collaborate across um, offices, teams, geographies. Quite often firms will find that the people in their corporate team have relationships with the same people in, for example, the employment team, but, but neither of these teams are aware of um, the strength and depth of the mutual connections they have. And this is leading to not only missed growth opportunities, as in being able to cross sell and um, collaborate more effectively, um, but it's leading to an inconsistent client experience. Often the case, a client will know that they've met with multiple people from your law firm, over the course of a, of a month or so. Um, however, the firm themselves don't know who's been meeting with that client. So often um, poor, poor client experience can result from that. Um, in terms of data, 
Nick's talked about big data and firms do have, you know, what we would class as big data. However, in, from, a, from a point of view of client relationship management type information along the lines of contact uh, accuracy, um, the quantity and quality of contact data that you can feed into your marketing and BD initiatives. Most firms we speak to are frustrated by the fact that data is simply missing or the data they have, they've lost trust in, it's incomplete, it's inaccurate, there's duplications been entered into various systems. And these firms are looking to find a more reliable data source and, and generate a better ROI from, from the um, initiatives that they're, that they're involved in. Um, firms have for many years invested in CRM technology um, or are considering investing in this type of technology but are concerned by the high failure rate of this type of technology um, and are wanting to ensure that if they are investing or continue to invest that there is a, a, a more reliable source of ROI, more proven way of getting return from this investment. For those firms that have CRM, they generally find a low user adoption. Lawyers generally find these systems um, a distraction. It's another system to go and log into. What's in it for me? I've become a data admin type person. And many of the systems that you may use or have used are, are reliant on manual data entry by busy professionals. So you know, lawyers having to stop what they're doing to go and re-key information that often already exists into this separate system. They're very quick to ask marketing for a very clean, accurate list of their contacts to invite to an event, but they don't really see that it's their task to enter this information in the first place. And for those firms that are actually making a good fist of these systems, um, we generally find that they um, are, um, it's due to perhaps um, hiring an army of people or um, introducing many um, often onerous processes to ensure that this data makes it into these systems so that they can then use it to, to drive growth. And, you know, CRM was supposed to be the answer to many of the, the, the topics we've discussed today. The 360 view of your client, understanding who knows who and how well. However, just to labor the point somewhat, perhaps much of the information that you would need to, to, to give you that 360 view just never makes it into CRM. And the data that does, you can see some statistics here that um, show you that the, the, the state and quality of that data only ever gets worse from the day it gets entered. Um, and actually the stat on the right hand side there is um, more like 75% from um, PwC's latest survey that we were party to where a huge amount of these projects fail um, due to generally a lack of user adoption or behavioral change. And for many firms, you know, one of the key issues is that cost and time of manual data entry. The legal sector recognizes more so than others that the, the, the time costs, you know, that time um, costs money and they would really like their professionals focused on client interactions, working on client matters, solving problems for their clients rather than entering data. I think the final issue with these systems is that going back to the list of questions that Nick posed at the beginning, the key to understanding your relationships is, is, is actually you're trying to answer these types of questions. In a law firm setting, even if your CRM system were to be full of every contact that you'd engaged with in the last 12 months, it would still be a flat list of contacts. Um, you're never sure if that is everybody that you know, and it certainly doesn't really give you an idea of who knows these people, how well, and how often they're engaging with them. And by answering these questions, you can solve a number of issues here. So looking at your um, key accounts, your key clients, you know, what is the strength of the relationship? Are there any risks? Are we only connected to a certain number of senior people? Which, which of our client relationship partners have the best relationships with these clients? So thinking around succession planning, you know, someone is leaving the business, retiring, um, moving to another firm, what clients are at risk? Where have we strong relationships with companies where we aren't generating any revenue? And is that what we would see as underutilized relationship capital that you could simply 
tap into some of those relationships you have and um, go and actively engage with that company in a more meaningful manner. So these are the sort of questions that I would say by bringing in systems such as CRM and looking at the data you have, these are the answers, these are the questions that you are looking for answers from. So moving on to um, IntraHive, and as Nick suggested, this isn't going to be a, um, a product pitch, but it's worth just looking at how IntraHive and technologies like it can help you to tap into this um, data lake that you have within your firm and start to try and provide answers to some of the questions that we just posed. So what IntraHive recognized is that you've actually got treasure troves of data across your business, which should give you insight if you could analyze this data in a meaningful way, should give you insights into who it is you're actually communicating with, who it is you're having relationships with in that business to business context. So you can see on the right of the slide here, there's some various icons. I'll mainly focus on the, um, the, the one to the top left, where if you imagine the thousands of emails in and out the building every day to your clients, your prospects, your intermediaries, your referrers, there is clues there as to who is communicating with who. Take that a step further, look at the meetings that are taking place in people's calendar, whether they be remote, face-to-face, -face, who's included in those meetings. IntraHive and other technologies can now analyze this huge lake of data that's being built up in your, um, in your um, existing business systems. And by simply looking at the metadata, the to, the from, the date, the time of these interactions, it can, first of all, build up a very accurate, a passively built database of all of the people you are actually communicating with. So that's step one. Who it, is, who it is you're communicating with. IntraHive then enriches those contact records. We might find a, an email signature with someone's mobile phone number or job title. We may then find relating information to those people outside of your organization, out in the social media space, blogs, um, companies' websites, etc. So we can give you a very clear picture of an accuracy of who it is you're communicating with and what does that person's role or seniority level mean to the, the, the organization that you're communicating with. However, just understanding who you're communicating with is just part of the jigsaw. IntraHive then uses what we call our relationship algorithm and we run this over the huge swathes of data that we find to ascertain the strength of that relationship. So just to touch on that, this is, yes, how many emails or meetings have taken place, but we use around 25 plus touch points to delve deeper into that. So what's the seniority of these people? We can recognize job titles, we can recognize function of that title. Um, how often are you communicating? And is that cadence increasing? Is it reciprocal? how fast do people reply and are those emails initial emails are they turning into meetings and are those meetings face to face 15 minutes on a monday or two hours over lunch every friday and bearing you know based on this um, um picture of of communications that we pick up we can ascertain quite accurately how the relationship is is growing who has the relationships and 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 over time how they are performing there's some other icons on there, you know, lots of firms will be calling their clients as well. And that could be an indicator of a stronger relationship if most of the communication is done over the phone or even text. And it, IntraHive and other technologies can now ingest call logs um, and records. Again, looking at the, the fact that someone called someone at this time and for how long. All of this data, though, would be really useful once we found it and enriched it, if we could put that back into your CRM system. And obviously, that is where you can then <clears throat> perform more powerful tasks, such as your marketing, your client segmentation, etc. So that's a sort of conceptual overview of where IntraHive is finding the data that might give us a clue to, to who you know and how well you know them. So... Um, that's really the, 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 an introduction to IntraHive and technologies like that. I thought that it might just be useful to actually show you some outputs of that um, and if you can really sort of bring this to life. So I'll just actually come off my... Um... Ah, where are we? 
excuse me a moment. So bringing that to life, if you can now imagine that um, you are able to tap into those treasure troves of data that we just mentioned, then you might be able to see that, for example, we're looking at a key account here of one of, our, one of your law firms. And in this instance, it's Stellar Mobile. They operate in the telecommunications industry. Al, I think you've lost um, the screen connection there. Ah. Yeah, I just wonder, if, did you want to switch to a screen that shows us something live, some live data? I did, yes. Uh, I'll tell you. Uh, Is that now working? Yeah, there you go. Okay. Yeah, that looks, that looks much better. Yeah, apologies for that. We, we do work in the tech space, um, honestly. <laughs> So, um, so yes, just bringing that data to life, we, we, we're connecting to various internal systems that, where data already exists, but we're making sense of it. So now here you can see that looking at a particular account such as Stellar Mobile, this is a client of your law firm, we now have a full picture of the fact that we have 52 relationships with Stellar Mobile. This is taken from source. So this will be everybody that you have actually communicated with over the course of six or 12 months once we've um, back mined data as such. We can see not only though the, the, the details you would normally find in a CRM system, we can find um, full names, we can find job titles, but we can also show you that there's been recent activity with this person and that nine of your colleagues have a connection to this person. We can pull in things like their social media handles. So nothing that uh, diligent human being, being couldn't do if they had the time or inclination, but we're just speeding that process up for you. We can see here the relationship strength with this individual. So overall, the nine people that know Morgan actually have a medium relationship with her. What's drawn my eye here is, is Alan Dunn, who I actually bumped into at a networking event a few weeks ago. He did mention he knew some of my colleagues at my law firm, but I wasn't quite sure who Alan Dunn knew. It turns out I've looked in our CRM system, and as we can see here, Alan hasn't been placed into our CRM system. So I can now find out though that actually, yes, this is Alan Dunn. I can see his job title, and I can actually see that I'm connected with Alan because I sent him an email after the networking event I bumped into him at, but I can now also see that 13 of my colleagues also have relationships with Alan. and Wheeler here, um, I can see that she had a meeting with him um, only uh, a month ago and has exchanged some emails, etc. So I'd like to speak with Alan. How do I collaborate more effectively? I can simply click through and invite some of these people to a collaboration session with, with myself. So I won't go into you know, um, too much detail here, but as you can see, there's various tabs of information that we can pull in. We can see all the activity that's taken place with Stellar Mobile. I can simply want to suggest that we only see um, meetings that have taken place, for example. I can see um, a breakdown of who do we know at Stellar Mobile? So where do these 52 people we know fit in terms of seniority or in terms of function? So understanding you know, and having a good relationship with the legal department at Stellar Mobile might be important for us. They're the people that outsource legal work. However, I can see we only have one relationship. Um, this person isn't in CRM either, but we seem to have a strong relationship and 13 of my colleagues know Emily. If Emily were to leave Stellar Mobile though, it might lead us, um, leave us a little bit at risk. So how about we set a KPI with the team here to maybe deliver some thought leadership on a particular telecoms related topic to Stellar Mobile and the legal team. Overall though, I can see that our overall relationship built up on all of the relationships we have is trending upward, um, actually fairly, fairly decent upward turn here. So I can now see that this key account of ours is actually um, the relationship seems to be trending in the right direction. Now in reality, you would see peaks and troughs in this data. It may be that you've ran a marketing campaign or held an event and you've invited a number of Stellar Mobile people too. And after that event, you could then track to see if that had any impact in the relationship strength. And the final way of looking at this data is to see that we have 52 relationships, but who at my law firm ha is, is supporting these relationships? Again, I can see here that Anne Wheeler seems to have the strongest relationship. That may be because Anne has 23 contacts at this company, 
with senior job titles and high relationship strengths with them. Interestingly, Sanjay is the client relationship partner. Um, you would assume that Sanjay therefore has the strongest relationship with Stella Mobile, but actually now we can lay that bare that Sanjay isn't actually as well connected as some of the, your other colleagues. So without sort of going into, you know, too much detail here, I just thought it would be useful to give you a taster to how once we can tap into the mass of data that you hold within your firm, how we can actually analyze that and bring it back to you in a more usable format, um, allowing you to um, you know, uh, interrogate the relationships, the relationship capital that you have with the companies that you're working with. So Nick, did you want to summarize today's discussion? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, ho hopefully that sort of gave a, um... Uh, maybe okay. just just a second before you jump into that, I mm. want to give the audience a chance to ask questions. Of course, yeah. Uh, and uh, one question that that sort of immediately came on top of my mind, looking at the presentation, is: um, Have you ever come across the question if this can be used to assess partner performance within the firm? Because you can sort of easily probably easily detect how uh, engaged partners are in building up relationships with key clients. So take Sanjay's case, he's the client relationship manager with Stella Mobile, but you see that he's by, by far not the most active in maintaining the relationship. So what, yeah. does that, what does that do with people assuming or claiming that they run the, the relationship yeah, uh, and it, it it comes to the fact that probably they don't. So exactly, and um, that is a use case for some of our clients. Um, um, predominantly outside of the legal space, we find that um, where organisations are far more um, perhaps BD and sales focused, they compensate their people on the um, uh, input they've had in building and generating work from relationships and until now it's been fairly subjective there will be a review um, periodically of how well people are performing and what relationships they're building with within their um, list of accounts as such uh, and yes until now it's been an object it's been a subjective um, discussion now actually this can lay that bare and, and can be you know can be used and it could be somewhat uncomfortable for people to to have it laid bare that they aren't actually meeting with or engaging with their clients as, as often as perhaps they are being asked to in a law firm setting though we do have um, a, a number of firms in the US where again they have a client origination partner type approach to to remuneration and um, again this is helping to um, reduce the amount of overpaid compensation if you're with me uh, where people are um, uh, proposing that they have had a significant impact in a new piece of work or or they've been collaborating effectively with other people in the firm on, this, on, on the particular client and again the data that Intrahive can bring in can can give real insights into that Harry Olf. Just, just two more questions short ones one is um, does this does Intrahive is sort of a meta crawler software, at least as far as it looks from my point of view, does it write back into the CRM because you've got this button to say sync to CRM? Sure. So I think where Intrahive started was, it was about um, giving you the insights into who you knew and how strong those relationships were. Um, once we started to work with um, professional services firms, was the first market that we entered and PwC or you know one of our largest clients they actually said well look we love this data that you're finding however we want to use it in different ways and, and where we where we would like the data to sit is within CRM so yes we programmatically connect to most major CRM systems we're fairly agnostic so once we found the data um, and in the portal that I just showed you that is just the face value of the data behind that will sit addresses, telephone numbers, et cetera, that we've managed to capture, we can programmatically write that into the fields, the, the relevant fields within your CRM system. From where you can then do more mature tasks like um, track opportunities, 
build dashboards, reports, um, and overlay the data that intra, intra Hive finds on activity levels and relationship trends. You can overlay that with other data that you may have in CRM or, or would like to use in you know, BI systems like Tableau or Power BI, for example. But without that data feed on relationships, it's always been uh, fairly tricky to, to, to include that information in, in, in those other reports that you're building. Okay, just just uh, just another one before we continue would be: uh, sure. Does Intrahive or is that data-driven thing also looking at sort of the legal documents? Are we just talking about emails, or are we also looking at attachments, um, notes, uh, briefs, and other stuff? And is there a chance to find out? what I would probably call the tonality of a conversation. Mm -hmm. So it can probably be that I have the strongest relationship with a client, but it derives from the fact that the client is pretty angry because we delivered yeah, uh, sure. uh, sort of in an, in an inpro, inappropriate way or whatever. And the sure. whole conversation is about what a shitty law firm we are, yeah, which uh, yeah. actually makes that a strong relationship, but not a good one. So there's two things there that, you know, um, you're, you're talking around sentiment analysis there. And we, we're interested in only the metadata, the header information of interactions. Um, you can allow us access to the body of the email, but that would simply be to enable us to write the content from that communication back to CRM if that's what you would like. The reality is, though, that none of our legal clients uh, that I'm aware of have granted us access to the body of the email. Obviously, you have client privilege um, and uh, confidential um, discussions ongoing. So we only need access to the header info. Um, subject line could be a, a halfway house. So you could, we could at least then report back the subject line of each communication, which might add a little bit more flavor. So you could get a, an understanding of what the communication were about. But in terms of sentiment analysis, you know, I always joke that maybe if we were to able to you know, analyze the body of an email for sentiment, then yes, we might spot angry, com combative words, um, Harry Olf, which would allude to the fact that the relationship isn't perhaps as great as the communication patterns may, may seem. Um, and, and yes, you know, um, the, word, the word beer, let's go for beer, might score high, more highly than just simply going for coffee. Um, I, I think the future is sentiment analysis and you know, we're certainly well placed with our data science team to, to, to be able to, to um, deliver that for clients moving forward. I think the sensitivities around client communications though may just prevent that even if the technology were available now. Okay, thank you. Any other questions uh, from, the, from the audience? Um, I still um, still wonder that no one asked about data privacy. So yeah, I can um, I can jump in there. You know, privacy is um, a huge concern, and and on our platform was it was built from a privacy first perspective. So we can um, uh, you know there will be communications that you will not want IntraHive to see or, or or rank or score, and that's very easy. There's there's a hundred plus privacy controls at an organisational level and at an individual level. So very simple things like marking an email as confidential. Um, hitting the confidential flag on an appointment, IntraHive will ignore those communications. Marking contacts as private, for example, would stop us from um, assessing any communications or relationships with that individual person. And that, that can be done, like I say, at an organizational level or at an individual level. Certain firms we work with will have clients where they want to totally blacklist that organization. Um, the example we use is if, if a client were working with for example, the Ministry of Defence and didn't want any of that relationship insights being um, being shared, then they could blacklist that whole domain and we would ignore that. So, yeah, privacy is um, is a normal concern for, for all of the all of the companies that we talk with. And um, yeah, we, we have a full um, set of functionality to, to, to get around, um, you know, to, to, to ensure that that is um, delivered as as they require. 
There's also M&A as well as the other sort of use case for exploring um, different kind of security modeling um, and certainly within the product that, that the ability for, for Chinese walls it's conversations I often have with um, the, the, the banking um, stakeholders and, and customers that I deal with that that is a huge issue the idea that um, you know particularly sort of M&A and corporate finance teams um, other tranches of the organization cannot for regulatory reasons obviously they cannot glean that there is relationships going on or that, you know, Fred is going out for lunch with John because it could infer that, you know, certain types of discussions run the way. Um, that's obviously a, a kind of prominent live issue for, for, for law firms as well that, um, you know, we, we discuss on a case by case basis with our customers. Let me, let me jump from the, from the technical terms to the behavioral aspect. Have you seen behavior change in law firms when using uh, this data-driven way of looking at relations? So what, what does it do to the people that suddenly um, yeah. have a way better um, insight into uh, the relationships and the strength of relationships they have with clients? But how do they, how do they actually use it to... Uh, to um, capitalize the, 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 the power of, of knowledge they gain from, from these insights? Yeah, so my, my experience pre-technology like this was that, you know, as the BD director in a law firm, lawyers would, would uh, generally be asking me, do we know anybody at this company or who has a good relationship with this client? And often the answer was, oh, I don't know, you know, let's just ask around and find out. Um, and the reason they were asking was to not try and then bypass that warmer relationship or that quicker way into that client. They were looking to collaborate. Now with IntraHive, we can lay bare exactly who has a relationship or who has the strongest relationship. And that simply speeds up collaboration. So, um, one of our clients um, I was talking with um, last week um, is using IntraHive as an onboarding tool for new partners. So during their you know, first few weeks induction, they will sit down with them and talk to them about the clients that they are hoping will follow them across to the new firm or which um, individuals that they have strong relationships with. And by simply entering those, those company names or individuals' names into IntraHive, they can very quickly see where there are also mutual connections and they can quickly see that you know the guy in corporate already knows this company that you um, that you're that you're working with and it just speeds up that collaboration harry Ulf, it um, it isn't designed for people to take the information and 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 use it you know it's designed to collaborate um, more effectively across offices and, and teams etc I think there's also a, there's, there's always a cultural concern as well. I know in the legal sector, there's always been this notion of my client and, you know, there will be um, um, lawyers and partners that, that fear this as in it's going to expose their relationships. However, I feel that unless if you actually want to be in control of your clients, then actually you need to share the fact that you have relationships with them because otherwise if you don't share, then you perhaps aren't using IntraHive and therefore one, you won't know that other people already know your clients and already have relationships within that company. But also people won't then be able to see that you do have strong relationships. So instead of reaching out to you to discuss that company or to affect an introduction, they may be reaching out cold to the detriment of the relationship that you're trying to protect. Did that answer the question? Absolutely. Uh, maybe, maybe another question as to uh, sort of the lock-in effect that IntraHive may create within a law firm. So uh, it would probably or ideally lead to a situation where I would not reach out to a potential client or to a contact uh, without having a look into IntraHive before because it would be a strange thing to call someone or to uh, approach someone if it made sense to uh, if, if, if to go for lunch or whatever, if not checked in IntraHive before what kind of relationship the firm already has. 
Yeah, and I think the, the way I'd answer that is um, in a couple of ways, but one of the things InDrive also does, um, seeing as we're a little bit more focused on the product now, is, is send you an email. Um, so seven o'clock in the morning, you'll get what we call a pre-meeting digest, um, which is a series of um, uh, data and insights. Um, some of it is kind of fairly generic, just in terms of the news associated with the client you're going to have lunch with. Um, and then there'll be a sort of, um, uh, I guess, a relationship piece on, you know, if you're a sort of a larger firm, multi-geography, just to understand the kind of the web of relationships that already exist in the recent sort of six or 12 months between your organization and this potential client organization. So I think Alan's getting one of those ready now, you can see. So, if, you know, I have like two, three meetings a day. Sometimes I have no meetings, but I get two or three of these um, every morning at seven o'clock clock and it just um, allows me to just sort of get ready for that meeting be a bit more credible in that meeting because it's telling me sort of what's going on and and what's what's been going on in terms of relationships between our two organizations it's pulling in you know from disparate data um, so it sees that I have a, a meeting with Jay Evans at stellamobile.com it's then gone out and tried to enrich the information found out you know found the photo his role type you can see the social media handles on the right you know, if he's forwarded the, the invite to Sanjay and Cheryl, it'll also include theirs. You can see below the model has shifted. I don't need to go to the CRM now. The CRM information comes to me. Um, and then there's just sort of different widgets, um, you know, potentially opportunities again from the CRM. Um, the yellow piece, recent emails, that's actually putting data from IntraHive rather than the CRM. So it's kind of augmenting. Um, the information. This is these are the real interactions that have been occurring in the recent past. Um, yeah. Just so I am ready and I can get on the phone to my colleagues and say, ah, I see you are recently in a meeting with the company I'm going to lunch with today. What do I need to know? Um, so, um, and you can pull extra information into this as well. So, um, you know, um, for some of our clients, they're interested in bringing data from other business systems. So a partner is about to meet Stella Mobile. Wouldn't it be useful if we could let them know how many matters have been opened? Who, um, you know, have they paid the latest bill? Um, what matters are ongoing? What the WIP situation looks like, for example, as well as the relationship data that we've already shown you in the portal. We're just going to play back some of that high level information here so you, you can understand what's going on. How is the relationship trending? Uh, and, you know, even to the point of you're about to meet Jacob, it looks like he has a relationship with your colleague, Karen, and so does Sanjay and Cheryl. So it would be remiss of me not to reach out to Karen before this meeting to, to find out what her relationship is with these three people. And there's, you know, these are widgets of information. So you can bring in other information from outside your business or from within existing business systems. Um, and, and equally, we are tracking people on your behalf. So the fact that we can see here that Phyllis Rose, IntraHive has spotted that Phyllis has actually left Stella Mobile and joined a different company. So that might not mean a lot, but it could mean to me that Phyllis Rose was one of my biggest supporters at Stella Mobile. So I need to perhaps cement a new relationship or in fact, could this be an opportunity for me to go and talk with Phyllis later this week in her new role? to see if she'd like to procure legal services from us again. So yes, you're absolutely right, Harry Off. It, driving behavioral change, you know, just giving people uh, a, a, a portal for them to go and log into and look at information um, hasn't always worked in the past. It's still a break from your work routine. So what we've recognized is that lawyers generally live in their outlook, they're replying to emails and what have you. So if we can send them a very useful email passively, uh, this makes the insights we find um, actionable at the most relevant time and could affect the outcome of that conversation. So um, is there any questions from anyone on the, um, on the call? Um, I can't see if there's been any um, questions asked, Julia, on the chat. No, there are no questions in the chat at the moment. I encourage them to activate their microphone or send us a mes message, but there's not one yet. I seem to be overwhelmed with the opportunities <laughs> of digging into so much data points um, and bringing that up to a uh, level from sort of things you can crawl from the web into 
deep dives into email conversations and relationship strength. I think that's 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 interesting. Um, in the end, let me let me come back to the to the um, behavioral aspect of all this. Uh, have you seen laggards or uh, in the positive sense, promoters of making use of this tool within law firms. So, um, I mean, even having all this information at hand still can lead people to just neglecting the fact that it exists or um, uh, coming up with the idea that this is, it's nice to have all that data at hand, but in the end, it is a relationship I know much better than any system will ever be able to do uh, and so uh, the way I treat this relationship is um, so sort of what is yeah. that a lack of acceptance in using the obvious yeah no you're absolutely right I think I'm obviously, just asking yeah. because I've been with law firms before yeah no, no. You're absolutely right. You know, purchasing technology, no matter how clever or um, simple it is, it is to use, um, it, it isn't um, isn't the answer in its in its own right. Certainly, you know, we spend a lot of time with clients um, on adoption. We, we have customer success managers that work with clients to ensure that people are trained, that people know how to use the technology. Albeit, in most cases, it's simply being able to read the email that we've been sent to them but certainly sending people useful insights isn't um, necessarily going to change the way that they approach their meeting um, on its own um, so so yeah you, you're absolutely right Harry off um, delivering better insights is is one thing getting people to engage and, and accept those insights is 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 always a challenge for any organization um, but we are seeing great success with with our clients we have multiple case studies on our website with uh, rafts of testimonials from um, happy end users and, and business teams alike um, but it is something that we, we work tirelessly on you know you have to keep your foot on the on the gas there to ensure that these insights are not only accurate but are also used and, and that's where you know the business itself needs to take um, uh, some sort of responsibility for that simply having the insights there doesn't necessarily mean you're going to foster better relationships with your clients but it certainly arms you with the tools and information and an objective way of assessing where the relationship is now what can we do to improve it and has our activities and, and efforts actually move the needle so i think we're we're close to the hour i want to make sure that no question stays unanswered i could also uh guess that a lot of questions have been answered over the course of the presentation and probably uh due to the fact that i didn't keep my questions <laughs> and jumped in probably covered questions other people would also have um just in terms maybe of uh, a look at um, I don't know if we uh, if we want to call it competition, but sort of the market that is developing. Do you see that there is a trend that is your friend, not just by uh, using this type of technology, but also by things that come up? You would see and say this is uh, this is part of a tr of a wider trend we see in the industry. Yeah, certainly. I, I think you know we we feel we perhaps even invented this market in 2012 that might sound fairly grandiose but um and you know around 2012 this technology was was just emerging and didn't really have a name i think you know people assumed that we were a crm provider um i think we're in that enterprise relationship management space or, or erm and yes there are other companies now um realizing the power of this data that exists already within your systems and are tapping into it in lots of different ways and um, this technology in the legal space that looks at your email patterns to assess risk whether people are emailing um, individuals information that they shouldn't be emailing them and um, looking at patterns in communication there 
to try and ascertain that. So there's lots of different ways in which the data you hold um, that we are simply assessing relationship strength based on those communication patterns. There are other ways in which that data could be um, interpreted and used for very different purposes. But um, yeah, certainly um, I, I do feel that even two, two and a half years ago when I joined IntraHive, this technology, although we had probably 20 or 30 law firms back then, we're now at more than 70. I think it was seen as um, very cutting edge um, back then. However, this is now becoming um, fast becoming the norm. You know, IntraHive alone brought on board over um, 60 new clients last year alone, um, many of which are, say, in the legal space. And, you know, um, in terms of professional services more widely, many more in that sector so it is certainly becoming widely accepted that this is our data in our systems created by our employees in work time on on our systems with our clients so you know the question of should we do this um, and can we do this is is now um, becoming a, a resounding yes um, and the benefits and the insights we provide far outweigh the, the concerns the initial concerns or the the perceived risks of doing so. Well, this sounds like uh, wonderfully crafted final uh, uh, closing remarks. Uh, I think that shows uh, two things. First of all, this was a fantastic and an interesting insight into the role of data and what, how data can drive client relationships, not only in the future, but also today with a um, uh, with an incredible thought through system uh, and I especially like the the daily reminder of what's up and and, and uh, what's coming up what um, your calendar shows today and what data can be pulled together in order to be better prepared for meetings so this is I think this is uh, highly interesting it's good to hear that you're in a good way uh, that you are th a thriving company that's what we uh, what we keep our fingers crossed for uh, we look forward to meeting you at whatever other occasions and I'd like to say thank you on behalf of ELTA and look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.